uh, talk about where uh, we feel the Lord is uh, leading our Father's house as we continue to grow and expand. I believe that this church is uh, undergoing transition in the best of ways as God continues to move us higher and farther into our uh, purpose and destiny as a local church. I'm very excited about that. Aren't you grateful for the growth and for the hand of the Lord and for all that God is doing? I think we have, uh, by the end of this year, we'll have 90 children, fifth grade and under. So praise the Lord. That's a lot of little disciples, amen? That's a lot of young sons and daughters that are never going to taste the filth of the world. They're going to walk with Jesus their entire life because they were born not in church but in Christ in the truth, amen? We want to disciple The kids, well, Acts chapter 1, Luke writes the book of Acts. Uh, He originally wrote um, his gospel, which we call Luke and Acts, as a two-volume set. So if you ever read Luke, you might want to jump into Acts and follow the train of thought because the 24 chapters of the gospel of Luke record the life of Jesus his death, and then his resurrection. And then what you have here in Acts is Jesus' ascension into heaven and then the birth of the early church. So we read Acts not as historical information, but as a blueprint for God's heart and his desire for the church. So here at our Father's house, we want to be a New Testament church. What does that mean? We want to follow the Word of God and we want to marry the Holy Spirit and the Word together. We don't have to pick and choose. Amen? So as we read Acts, I want to make a a few points. We're going to start right at the very beginning in verse 1 of Acts chapter 1. Luke writes the first account. He's referring to the gospel that he wrote. The first account I composed, Theophilus about all that Jesus began to do and teach, until the day when he was taken up, after he had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. To these he also presented himself alive. Would you say alive? Alive. After his suffering, by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. And gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait. Say it with me. Wait. Wait. Wait for what the Father had promised which he said, you heard of from me. For John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And so when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time that you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it's not for you to know times or epochs which the Father has fixed By his own authority. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria. And even to the remotest part of the earth. Father, would you give us clarity this morning as we read and study and discuss your word. God, I pray that you would open the eyes of our hearts I pray, Lord, that your word would come this morning like a freight train and that you would come in power. Lord, we're asking that truth would prevail. We're praying right now that in an hour of darkness and chaos and mass deception, that your word and your truth and the fame of your name would shroud out and cloud out and push out every other agenda. Lord, we thank you that you are high and lifted up, that you are the king of of glory whether we crown you or not you are glorious so lord we agree with your word this morning and we thank you for what you want to say to us your people in Jesus' name amen. amen so here we have the lord jesus he presents himself alive and he appears to the disciples now it's interesting if you continue to read Acts chapter 1, can anybody tell me how many people were found in the upper room for that prayer meeting where the Holy Spirit's poured out? 
Say it louder. 120 are in the upper room. 120 followed the instructions of Jesus. Hey, wait for what the Father had promised to do, which you heard of from me. John the baptizer was putting you in water, but now Jesus is going to baptize them in the Holy Spirit. And so he wanted them to wait. Now, interestingly, in 1 Corinthians 15, if you go and read it, The Apostle Paul says that the risen Jesus appeared to 500. He appeared to 500. He didn't just appear to the 120. So it begs the question, what happened to 380? Y'all following me? I cheated in math too. It's okay. 500. We end up with 120. Perhaps it was that they couldn't wait for what God had promised. Perhaps it was that maybe they got busy or they got distracted. Perhaps it was that they had somewhere better to be or at least they thought. And Jesus was telling them, he appears, he dies, he's resurrected. Hey, go into the city, wait for what I promised. Wait for what the Father promised. And so they gather together and they're praying with one heart and one mind. And we understand that the Holy Spirit is poured out on the day of Pentecost. And essentially the church is born through supernatural power. I have come to learn in my life that many times I can miss what God wants to birth in my life if I am unwilling to wait on the Lord. Waiting is very painful. I don't mean waiting five minutes. Dear God, we live in an instant society. We get upset when the internet doesn't work in ten seconds. We are more hasty, more busy, more anxious than perhaps any other group of people that's ever lived. And here's the instruction from the Lord Jesus. Wait for what the Father had promised. And he's talking about the Holy Spirit being poured out. But I want to talk to you this morning about what are you waiting for God to do in your life. What are you waiting for and believing for? What are you in process about that's going to require you to wait on God in order to see it fulfilled? I don't know about you, but my temptation through my life has been to run ahead of the Lord. You need to know yourself. Some of you fall behind God. You need to understand your bent. Are you more prone to dig in and get stuck and stubborn and fall behind the Lord when He's wanting to move you forward? Or are you a little more like me where you want to run ahead of the Lord? See, I've had God speak things into my heart. I've had Him drop things in my spirit. And I'm like, I just assume now. Like, boom, He wouldn't. It's like the Lord's like, hold on, come here. Like, wait a minute, come back. It's like, hey, it's like I'm talking to Daniel. I wasn't done talking to you. Turn around. Come back. Just just wait a minute. When God wants to birth something in the earth, when the Lord is on the move, what precedes great outpourings of the Holy Spirit is waiting and praying. Oh, I can't think of two things our flesh hates more. Can you imagine if we threw a conference and we called it waiting? (laughs) We're going to get together and we're going to wait on God. What does that even mean? But waiting is not inactivity. Waiting is an intentional leaning upon the Lord. See, in order to wait on God, you have to restrain yourself and trust in Him. If I'm waiting on something to happen, it requires trust that it is going to happen. Actually, when I wait on God, do you know what I'm confessing? I don't have the power to do this without you. Perhaps you're like me and you run ahead of the Lord because you think, I got this, I can do this, and we forget that we need the Lord. That we need His strength, that we need His guidance, that we need His wisdom and His direction. So Jesus is clearly telling them, wait, 
Wait for what I promise. Some of you, the Lord has promised you many incredible things. But you can get tired and weary while waiting on God. You can grow weary. Instead of waiting patiently, we wait impatiently. I heard an older man pray in a prayer meeting years ago and it always stuck with me. He prayed and he said, Father, forgive us for confusing our timing with yours. I don't remember anything else he said, but it grabbed a hold of my heart. How many times have I confused my timing for God's timing? Am I the only one that's like, hurry up, Lord? Is it just me? Come on. Did you notice what Jesus talked to them about? Jesus, the Son of God. In the flesh, crucified, resurrected, three days later, raised by the power of God. He appears and comes back to the disciples. Read it with me in verse 3 so you're not lost. What's he talk to them about? And speaking of the things concerning the next political election. No, hold on, I'm going to go there. I'm going to give you the moment you're waiting for. He spoke to them concerning the things of the kingdom of God. We are not to be distracted in this hour. See, I fear for a church, and I have a great concern that in this hour, especially with what happened last night with the assassination on Trump. Anybody live under a rock? They tried to kill him, he survived. I fear that this is going to start a massive distraction for the church of Jesus Christ in the earth. I'm well connected with pastors and leaders and the amount of pressure to give political commentary rather than spiritual guidance is real. If I inspire you to vote but not to repent, I failed you. and about elephants and donkeys and right and left and this is about the things concerning the kingdom of God so we were all shocked and oh my goodness but can I be honest with you I didn't need a bullet to almost go through our former president's head to figure out that our nation is in a moral decline and America needs God I mean if you just woke up and whoa the world is evil no we've been killing babies in this nation for more than 50 years and the blood of those unborn children is crying out from the ground to our God he's listening and paying attention the perversion of Hollywood the normalization of homosexuality or even pedophilia listen we've gone off the rails and only the Lord Jesus only the king of the kingdom of God can bring people back into alignment with him but it's not gonna happen at a ballot box it's going to happen in the prayer room it's going to happen in the secret place See, the church has taken the bait and become anything other than spiritual. Forget the kingdom of God. No, we want to be political. We want to be social. We want to be racial. We want to be relevant. And Jesus appears. I'm going to take my notes from him. And he speaks to them concerning the things of the kingdom of God. Can I urge you in this hour of distraction and chaos and fear, remain focused on the kingdom of God. You fix your eyes on the king and let everything else take its proper perspective. I believe in being salt and light in the earth. If you want to misunderstand me, that's your prerogative. If you want to hear something I'm not saying, that's your choice. But I'm going to be concerned with the things of the kingdom of God. Because you can vote and still go to hell. Good morning. Welcome to our Father's house. My name is Paul. I'm really not angry, I promise. But I am provoked and stirred in my spirit. Don't be distracted. I'm not saying stick your head in the sand and... No. Be salt. 
be light, speak truth, make a difference. Amen? Amen. Jesus says, John baptized with water, verse 5. You shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Did you know God wants to baptize us in the Holy Spirit? Every time I preach the baptism of the Holy Spirit, people leave the church. So I guess we're making more room this morning. No, God wants to baptize you in the Holy Ghost. When you get laid back in water, what part of you is not wet? Every part of you is wet. Every part of you. Your head, your toes, every part of you is wet. When we lay you back in water, every part of you is immersed. God wants us, every part of you, every part of who you are, to be baptized, to be immersed in the Holy Spirit. Even your intellect. God, baptize my intellect in the Holy Ghost. So that I think how you think. So that my thoughts and the meditations of my heart are pleasing to you. When you get baptized in the Holy Spirit, everything changes. When you get filled with the Holy Ghost and He puts His Spirit in you and you don't just get a drink of water and you don't just, oh, I got the Holy Spirit and He's like right here and He lives in the four chambers of my heart. We're talking about being fully immersed in the realm of the Spirit where you become spiritually awakened, where the gifts and the power of God begin to flow through your life, where you're not doing things on a natural basis, but you are fun- Functioning in Holy Ghost power. This is the desire of God for every believer, not just for a special group. When you get baptized in the Holy Spirit, you read the book of Acts and you see when they get filled with the Holy Spirit, God's power is made manifest. There's prophecy, there's tongues. If you're waiting to understand tongues, you're asking the wrong questions. We live in the Midwest. Hoosiers, we're very smart. Can I tell you, I've met a whole lot of people that are just too smart to pray in tongues. Like, yes, God wants to take the most unruly member of your body, which is your tongue, James chapter 3. And He wants you to babble for His glory. Somehow, someway, I can't fully explain it, but I can witness to it that when I pray in the Holy Ghost in a language I don't understand, I get clarity. The people around me might be confused. But God is speaking to my spirit. I'm praying in the Holy Ghost. You will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Just wait. Some people want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit in a weekend. And when it doesn't happen, they quit waiting. They quit praying. They just walk away. Can I encourage you? Keep seeking. Keep going after God. Surround yourself in good biblical teaching that's going to exhort you in the things of the Spirit. But get hungry for the Lord. Figure out why you're not as hungry for God as you know you should be. Let God remove all those barriers and obstacles and get filled continuously with the Holy Spirit. It amazes me. Ephesians 5.18 has to be a stunner for so many where we are commanded through Paul's writings, we are told, be filled with the Holy Spirit. If God didn't want to fill every believer with the Holy Ghost, that would be an unfair and an impossible commandment. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Before that it says, do not be drunk with wine, for that is dissipation. Don't be drunk with wine, it's debaucherous, but instead... Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Do you see that those things are connected and those thoughts? I don't know if you've ever been drunk before, but you become inebriated and you lose consciousness of yourself. Now you're drunk and you're in sin, but when you get filled with the Holy Spirit and God's power takes over your life, here's the deal. You do a lot more thinking about God and a lot less thinking about you. 
your inhibitions, your insecurities, your fears, your worries. God drives them out and He fills you with His Spirit. This isn't something that happened on the day of Pentecost and then Jesus went in His uh, recliner of love and righteousness and sat back and let the world run. God wants to continuously fill His people with His Spirit. This is the great promise that we have. I'm hungry to be filled more and more with the Holy Spirit. I want to lay hands on the sick and see them recover. I want to see healings and miracles. And I'll never stop wanting to see God demonstrate His power and His glory. Because it's the whole purpose for being here on earth. To be filled with the Spirit. Look again at verse 8. I want to make one point. Jesus says, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And, would you say and? And "And you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, even to the remotest part of the earth. We have done a great disservice in our understanding of this passage because I don't know how many times in my life I have heard that you get filled with the Holy Spirit and God gives you power to be a witness. Jesus said, you will, follow me, Jesus said you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses. So being a witness for Jesus is one part or one chapter of the whole book of being filled with the Holy Spirit. We've dumbed it down and made it real small. Like when you get filled with the Holy Spirit, you get power to be a witness. That's one aspect of it. When you get filled with the Holy Spirit, you receive power, period. Stop right there. You don't just receive power to go tell somebody about Jesus. You receive power to live a victorious life over sin to not fear death and hell and the grave you become full of the Holy Ghost and an authority comes upon you where you become dangerous to the powers of darkness and you make a difference in your sphere of influence when you receive the Holy Ghost power flows through your life Power over sin, power over darkness, power over fear that wants to rule the world. It's so much more than being a witness, but God wants to do it in us before He does it through us. When I preach Christ to people, I preach who He is to me. I testify of what He's done in my life. Nobody can talk you out of your own testimony. They weren't there, you were. So by God, yeah, be a witness. But if the gospel that you're witnessing to can't deliver you from sin, you haven't been filled with the Holy Spirit. Lord knows we don't need more compromise in the church. Our nation is full. This is a Christian nation. I believe this is a nation that has mostly forsaken God. Because I'm not blind and I'm not ignorant and I am paying attention to the vast moral decline that we are under. Can I say it again? I didn't need somebody to try to kill the president to figure out that this world is evil. That American, this is a, just a one, another testimony of how godless we are. And until people turn to Christ and repent of their sins and understand that there's more to life than the next election cycle, my hope isn't in the White House, whether Biden gets reelected or Trump gets reelected or Joe Schmo gets elected, Jesus is seated on the throne and he is my great hope and I will not waver from my mission whether who I like gets elected or not, my hope is in the kingdom and the life to come. Dear Lord, Jesus is standing before Pilate and he says, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would be fighting you. 
to prevent me from being delivered up. But you know what? Because my kingdom's not of this world, I'm going to lay down my life. I'm going to take the authority that God gave me and I'm going to lay down my life and I'm going to take it back up again. I'm going to trick the devil and I'm going to set the whole world free free through my sacrifice and I'm going to offer people a new and a fresh start by my blood. Nobody could talk Jesus out of the cross even though it didn't make sense to the rulers and the principalities at the time. Christ is king. Word of God says that he sets up kings in the earth and he takes them down. Can I encourage you that Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit didn't have like a special panic room meeting last night? Like, oh no, what do we do now? Oh, it says in Psalm chapter 2 that Jesus, that the Father, that the one who sits in the heavens laughs while the kingdoms and rulers of this world plot against the Lord and His anointed. He sits in the heavens, He laughs, and then it says the Lord scoffs at them. (laughs) <laughs> he's not like ha huh. it's like ha ha that's hilarious they're trying to take us out they, Jesus cannot be dethroned so long as you're in him it doesn't matter what happens to you in this life you make sure your life is right with Christ because he's the creator and the owner and the one who all things are by him for him through him and unto him if Jesus appeared back from the dead speaking of things concerning the kingdom of God that's good enough for me I'm going to preach things concerning the kingdom of God and I want to encourage you to do the same You can get caught up in a whirlwind of distraction and fear and insanity and paranoia. And God wants better for his sons and his daughters. Amen. Amen. Psalm 37. I love it that the angels right after what we read. Say, the way that Jesus went up, you just saw him ascend into heaven, he's going to come back that way. Just as you saw him ascend, he's going to descend. Psalm 37. This is a psalm of David, verse 1. Do not fret because of evildoers. Let me try that again. Do not fret because of evildoers. Be not envious toward wrongdoers. For they will wither quickly like the grass and fade like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. What am I supposed to be doing with my life? Trusting in God. Doing the things which He says are good. Dwelling in the land and feeding on the faithfulness of God and how good He is. Delight yourself in the Lord, verse 4. And He will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in Him and He will do it. And He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your judgment as the noonday. Hang on. Does that mean... That if I delight myself in the Lord, I'm going to get everything that I want. Is this a recipe for manipulating God like some have understood it to be? Well, if I delight myself in the Lord, He's going to give me the desires of my heart. Well, when your desires aren't God's desires, He's going to put His desires in your heart as you delight in Him. So as we delight in the Lord, we become like Him. God changes us from the inside out. I don't know about you, but He's put a new spirit in me. When I meet people that from a past life, they don't recognize me and I don't recognize them. Because a new spirit is in me. A new heart is in me. A new mind is in me. I really am a new creation in Christ. Because of the work that He's done on the cross. Because He filled me with His Spirit, as I delight myself in the Lord, He gives me the desires of my heart, which are really the desires of His heart. I say this often. Aren't you grateful for unanswered prayers? I am. 
I'm thankful that the Lord didn't answer every desire of my heart because I asked with impure motives and I didn't even know it. It says, commit your way to the Lord. What does that mean? If you're like me and you like to get ahead of God, then you go and you start something and you get it moving and rolling and you're like, Lord, please bless what I've started. Committing your way to the Lord means allowing God to inaugurate, allowing Him to begin something, and then you give Him all the praise and all the credit and all the glory along the way. It doesn't mean go and start something and say, Lord, where are you? It says, you wait for the Lord. If we commit our way to the Lord, one one part of committing our way to the Lord is being willing to wait on God. Verse 7, rest in the Lord and wait patiently. How should I wait? Wait patiently for Him. Do not fret because of Him who prospers in His way. Because of the man who carries out wicked schemes. Boy, does this feel relevant this morning. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. It leads only to evil doing. Where does worry lead you and I? Evil. If you want to be out of step and out of partnership with the Spirit, step into worry and anxiety and fear. God has not given us a spirit of fear. We don't respond to current events the way the world does. And I think the church largely missed what God wanted to do in 2020 through COVID-19. But I'm determined to do my part to make sure that we don't miss whatever's next. God wants a people that are anchored and rooted and grounded in Him. Resting in the Lord. Waiting on the Lord. Not fretting because of evildoers. Because of those that think they're prospering and getting away with things in this life. It says the Lord. For evildoers will be cut off. Verse 9. But those who wait for the Lord. What happens to them? They reap and they inherit the land. Yet a little while and the wicked man will be no more. And you will look carefully for his place and he won't be there. But the humble will inherit the land. And they will delight themselves in, are you ready for it? Abundant prosperity. What kind of prosperity? Oh, isn't that the same thing? Apparently not. Prosperity, abundant prosperity. God wants to bless those who are willing to wait on Him. Those who are willing to trust in the Lord and not run ahead of Him. As a church family, guess where we are right now? Waiting on the Lord. Where are we going? What's happening next? How are we going to get there? What leads do you have? We are waiting on the Lord. We are trusting in the Lord. Do you know that the lease and where we're going next and the children and all this, you can spend time getting anxious about it. Hey, I've been there. Everybody that says, we're pregnant. I'm like, praise the Lord. And inside I'm like, oh, dear God. Lord, did you hear someone else is pregnant? There's more children coming. What do, what do we do? And the Lord's like, just trust in me. Wait on me. Rest in me. When we wait on the Lord, we allow God to be God. Are you all hearing me? I'm trying to encourage you and myself in the Lord this morning. That I know that we're not walking in the fullness of everything we want to see. Perhaps you've been waiting, but you know what? God is a God of the process. And there are just some things in this life that don't get hammered out in our character without being made to wait. We are waiting corporately. Many of you are waiting individually. Can I exhort you to wait patiently upon the Lord? I find that when I get impatient, when I become like a petulant little child, God's such a good father, he makes me wait longer. (laughs) 
Why? Because he's more interested in transforming me than he is in giving me what I, whatever it is I think I want. Has anybody in here ever been through a period of waiting on the Lord? Perhaps that's where you are today. You don't know what's next. You're believing God for something else, something more, something bigger. This is an exhortation to wait patiently upon the Lord. Do not fret. It only leads to evil. One more place, Isaiah 40. Turn a few books to the right. Isaiah 40. Have you made the connection that we are waiting on Jesus to return? We are waiting on the return of the Lord and we are waiting patiently. Because Jesus is going to split the eastern sky and at the blast of the trumpet and the twinkling of an eye, He's going to wrap it all up and we're going to rejoice. And unfortunately, a whole lot of people are going to realize they were dead wrong, but it'll be too late. Isaiah 40, verse 28. Do you not know, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable or vast. The word here means almost mysterious. The understanding of God is without limits. There's nothing that he doesn't understand. There's nothing that confuses him. There's nothing that surprises him. God doesn't have a yesterday and a tomorrow. He is before all things. He is outside of time and space. When God spoke the world into existence, He pre-exists even time itself. We struggle thinking about eternity. How long is that? Immeasurable. His understanding is inscrutable. He doesn't become weary or tired. You can say good night to God, but he's not going to sleep. He gives strength, verse 29. He gives strength to the weary. Are you weary this morning? God wants to give you strength. Are you broken hearted this morning? God wants to comfort you. And to him who lacks might, he increases power. Though youths grow weary and tired, and vigorous young men stumble badly, yet those who, say it with me, yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. God wants to refresh us, His people, this morning as we wait on Him. Raise your hand again if you're waiting on the Lord. If that's your season, that's where you're at. Can I ask you to stand to your feet? Those of you who feel like you're in a waiting season, I want to pray for you. Taylor and I are right there with you. If you did not stand to your feet, would you mind just placing your hand around someone who was? It seems like there's more people waiting than not. Father, I just thank you, Lord, this morning that you're going to give us the grace to wait on you patiently. Father, I pray right now that you would just forgive us for trying to get ahead of you, for trying to run out in front of you. Father, would you forgive us? Lord, for confusing our timing with yours. Would you forgive us for being impatient? God, I thank you that you know our needs. Father, Jesus taught us to pray that you already know what we need before we even ask. But you still want us to ask because you desire a relationship with us. So, Father, we're asking this morning for the grace 
to wait patiently and to trust in you. God, I pray that you would help every person that stood this morning to be strengthened right now. Lord, your word says that you do not grow tired or weary and that you refresh and that you give new strength to those who wait on you. So Lord, we commit this day as a fellowship and those individually and those families to wait on you patiently, to not run out ahead of you. God, I thank you that as we wait, that you are going to work. That as we wait, that you are going to move. That as we wait, you are going to give the breakthrough. You are going to supply the open door. You are going to meet every need, Father, because this is who you are. And we anchor our hearts in the truth of your goodness, of your kindness and your grace. And we commit this morning to remind our soul, wait on the Lord. Jesus, we receive this new strength from you. Teach us how to delight ourselves in you and you'll give us the desires of our heart. Lord, we commit our way to you. And we say yes again to the beautiful process of waiting, of discerning, of hearing your voice. Lord, give us a heart to obey. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would the rest of you stand? If you are waiting on the Lord and you feel like you are uh, not hearing anything, we would love to pray for you and just see if God would speak. I'm not promising you some kind of future revelation, but I do believe God works through His people and through the prophetic and through things breaking open. I know that the Lord has dropped a lot of things in my spirit through other people praying for me. So if you feel stirred and you would like prayer, I want to just ask you to come forward after I uh, say the amen and finish this service. We'd love to lay hands on you and just believe God with you. But I want to say one last thing. Oftentimes we don't accurately hear the voice of God because we have already determined what He's going to say. Are you all hearing me? I, and it's like, what if the Lord wants to, you got to wipe the slate and humble your heart and just God speak to me again. Amen. And God is gracious to speak to us more than once. Don't have anxiety about missing the will of God. He wants you in His will more than you want to be in His will. Amen. Amen. Okay, we love you. God bless you. Please don't forget about the sign up for the Home Run Derby and other